Ladies and gentlemen, our president, Mr. Larry Carter.
But this is the problem. And you know this as well as I do. It doesn't work. If it did, our schools would be off the charts in student test scores and in salaries to all employees. Let's be honest, though. Some of us and some of our schools are doing better, but just think if we had funding. Just think if we had funding to combat poverty, to get K-12 teachers and school employees paid up. Higher education, faculty, and staff paid up to get to the Southern Regional Average and beyond. What that would mean. I pause because I'm upset. Because when I talk to those individuals, they really mean what they say because they've never stepped inside of a classroom for the most part. I pause because I want you to think about what you experience in the classroom, when you go to a neighborhood store, and when some of your own family ask you why are you in education? Why do you teach at the college level? They don't pay you enough. They don't give you the respect you deserve. That's why I'm pausing. More of our K-12 schools, colleges, and universities will certainly do better if we made the investments they need and deserve. But the bottom line, we know a different way. Instead of privatization, instead of deprofessionalization, instead of cutbacks, we should be investing in public education investing in the dedicated teachers, paraprofessionals, and school-related personnel, investing in a dedicated college and university faculties and staff. What I thought, we can support and improve teaching and learning and teaching and learning environments. If we remember one thing, our students' learning environments are our teaching environments. So when someone comes to you and say, you're fighting for yourselves, not for your students. Remember, the same learning environments that our students are in, you're teaching in. So as you advocate for better support and funding for public education, who are you fighting for? The, kids. the students, the children, the kids. When you're fighting for a salary increase, when someone will tell you, it's self-serving. You know what you're fighting for? Not only to recruit the best and the brightest educators into our field because they're leaving and going to other professions, but you're fighting to retain those experienced veteran teachers who we need and depend on to help not only our students, but some of our new teachers and school employees. <laughs> now, one thing I want you to be aware of is that the budget deal that was reached in 2018 after three special sessions, it created a stable, sustainable budget. But it did so with regressive sales taxes and will only be in effect until 2025. While it was certainly better than nothing and it stopped the state from falling off the quote unquote fiscal cliff, it really just kicked the can down the road for later legislative sessions to deal with. <laughs> now to achieve our goals, and if you had not seen, I, I know we did a place at the Flesh Club about a week ago, and um, I say some of these same things, but I want to repeat them for those of you who may not have heard or seen it. But there was a recommendation by a task force that we believe will help us in the future when we talk about funding public education and higher ed. And to achieve those goals, we found that legislators should adopt the recommendation of that task force. The task force was called the Structural Changes in Budget and Tax Policy. And that would certainly address 
some of our structural tax problems. This will help to ensure that there is sufficient revenue to invest in the future of our children. And that report has some really interesting and important recommendations that affect public education. It recommended the following. A formal multi-year spending forecast for the MFP. A look actually at to how to find ways to accelerate the pay down of the unfunded accrued liabilities in the state pension systems. It acts to review the various tax credit rebates, deductions, and exemptions to the state taxes to determine whether they can be eliminated, yes. curtailed, and closely regulated. It also looked at changes to the state personal income tax law. These recommendations, we feel, are the best ways to guarantee a sustainable, predictable, fair state budget that will meet the needs of public education and all other services that our citizens depend on. Now, the state of Louisiana is long overdue and making meaningful investments in K-12 and in higher education, which is why Governor John Bell Edwards, we look at them today, is committed to increasing funding to the MP MFP and raising pay for teachers and support personnel to the Southern Regional Average. We will work with the governor and with legislators during the 2019 legislative session and beyond to elevate our profession and highlight its importance in growing our state's talent pipeline and the state economy. Now, one of the things you'll hear often is we had a cycle of school board races. We'll be having a cycle of legislators 2019, and then we'll have the governor's race as well. And you'll hear people talking about, can you do this alone as an organization? One of the things most of us found out, just with this cycle alone, is that as a teacher's union, you cannot do this alone. No matter how big we may be, and we're pushing almost 20,000 members in the state of Louisiana, just with our organization. If you look at the other organization, the Louisiana Education Association, they have somewhere around 11,000. If we combine, we have a much stronger voice in the state when it comes to the issues that impact public education. But we're separated. But in some of these issues, we come together and we fight together. So one of the things I found that collaboration is a big part of the work that we also need to be doing in our communities. Not just labor organizations, but their community organizations, grassroots, and some of those historic organizations that we should be collaborating with when issues come on the ballot or when there's issues that come in our schools that impact teaching and learning in a negative way. And find a way that sometimes it may not always have to be our voices, but those that believe in some of the same things we believe in, that their voices can carry the weight. And just believe this, that we have parents sitting here right now. One of the most powerful groups in our state, if they really organize themselves, could impact education tremendously, and that's parents. They're one of the most strongest bodies of individuals in our state, when it comes to education in any community, for example, I give you in New Orleans. If there's a large percentage of parents in New Orleans, they can shut a school down. Because a charter school has an independent school, or you have to have a cluster. If the parents decide we're not sending our kids there, that school is shut down. And your parish is where you may have a one system instead of a system of schools. That may be a little more difficult because you're talking about tens of thousands of students and you're talking about a lot more parents. And most of our school districts around the state are starting to look at the charter school model. As I travel the state, I've heard some of those conversations because they're actually being targeted. Remember when I said earlier, doing more with less? You take in charter school. <coughs> Money's not only come from public sources, it comes from private sources as well. And they can say it took us less to educate a child because the private funds supplanted with the public funds. So parents have a large impact when they organize themselves and whether or not you have a school or someone else doesn't have a school. 
So for me, when I think about this word collaboration, collaboration for me, while it's not a silver bullet, and it, is, and it could be considered an essential tool that builds a culture of trust, it's a way for us to form a collective responsibility. Because most of the time, people make decisions about the things that happen in our schools and our colleges and universities. They haven't set a foot in there. But when you and you and you are in the room with them and discuss not just your needs, but what it takes to adequately educate a student, what are the funding that's needed for that, and the struggles you have to do more with less. Just think that we were able to adequately fund public education and what that would mean, not just for our communities, not just for our schools, but for our state. Some of you have kids. One of the things we would hope is that they stay in the state and contribute to the state, but I promise you, when you start seeing those college bills and how high tuition is, and how the professor that was at LSU now works in Alabama because he or she doesn't have an adequate pay. We lose talent every year. And when we have university professors leaving from LSU to go to Alabama, Ole Miss, and take the millions of dollars of grants with them, our flagship universities may not always be that flagship university. Well, I don't like doing the doom and gloom, I do want to talk about us and talk about the program that we're trying to develop to really talk to the governor, to really speak to the legislators, to speak to school board members, to speak to superintendents, and most of all, speak to parents and community partners. And that collaboration builds that culture of trust that builds and forms a collective responsibility. But I'll say for us too, in the spirit of collaboration, we can be the change that we seek and that we deserve. You heard earlier when Jackie did her presentation, you heard me when I opened up, I said, we care. You know what we care about? Our students, our parents, the community, and each other. You often heard, we show up. We show up to work to do our very best to educate our future leaders and citizens. We fight for adequate funding for public education, worker rights, fairness, and equity, and many, many other things. At least not I forget. Because you know the work that we do, politicians determine some of our fates whether the school is adequately funded, whether you receive pay raises, or whether we have the resources that our citizens need, like health care. We vote. We vote like our professional lives depend on it. And I'll leave you with this for me. We can't rely on others do the work for us. It's up to us to continue to care, to show up, to fight, and to vote. And I believe that we keep that recipe, we'll be successful. I want to thank you for listening, and I would hope, hope heart, I mean, I would just hope that you take this time over the Thanksgiving break enjoy time with your families, friends, and loved ones. And I certainly want to thank publicly the two parents who are here today. Your daughter got up and spoke boldly. She got up and spoke clearly. And if you did not see, the audience stood because we believe in you. Thank you parents for allowing her to share her talents with us.
And like I said before, it's about her. It's about all of our kids around this state. Thank you so much. Thank you.